This is a revision video for the fourth topic in paper two of AQA GCSE Combined Science or GCSE Chemistry. This is unit nine, the chemistry of the Earth's atmosphere. Now unit nine is quite straightforward, it's quite a short unit and it doesn't contain a lot of complicated or hard to understand facts. But it does contain two things that could trip you up. Firstly, there are lots of opportunities for data analysis, for ratios and for graph interpreting and for testing all of those mathematical skills which will make up 20% of your chemistry GCSE. The other thing it contains is the opportunity for you to get a little bit confused about which part of the specification is being tested. So it's really important as you're learning this material and revising this material that you're clear on which questions are asking you about the last 200 years and which questions are asking you about the last 200 million years. Let's get started. Unit 9 starts off by talking about the modern atmosphere. And when we say modern, we're using that term fairly loosely. For about the last 200 million years, the composition of Earth's atmosphere has been pretty much constant. And that's about four-fifths or 80% nitrogen and about one-fifth or 20% oxygen. Now, it's possible that just from your everyday knowledge or maybe from studying geography, you might know more precise proportions than that. But for the sake of GCSE combined science or GCSE chemistry, all we need to know is four-fifths to one-fifth. Now, in addition to that, there are small proportions of other gases. There's a tiny, tiny amount of carbon dioxide, although it's tiny, but it is very important. There are variable amounts of water vapour, and that's going to change based on things like how close to the ocean you are. And then there are also noble gases, those very, very unreacted gases that we find in group zero. So helium and neon and argon and so on and so forth. Now, you may be asked to compare and contrast the modern atmosphere with how the atmosphere was when the Earth first formed or looking at how this has changed over the last hundred years or so. It's important that if one of these questions does come up, that you're clear on whether you're being asked to describe the evolution of the Earth's atmosphere over massive geological time, or whether you're just being asked to talk about the Industrial Revolution. The Earth's atmosphere first formed around 4.6 billion years ago. Now we have a pretty good idea of what the Earth's atmosphere was like at this time, but you might be asked, why can't we be absolutely certain? Now the trap that people fall into is they say, well, nobody was around to see. But there weren't any humans around 10 million years ago, and we have a very good idea of what the Earth's atmosphere was like at that time, because we have ice cores and we have rock samples and all sorts of things that provide us with evidence. The problem with looking at the atmosphere 4.6 billion years ago is that we just don't have enough evidence. We just don't have enough proof. So if you're asked why we can't be certain what the Earth's atmosphere was like to begin with, you want to be saying there's a lack of evidence. Now, over time, as science has moved on and we've learned new things, we've gathered more evidence. And so sometimes our theories have needed to change to accommodate that, because that's what we do as scientists. We do experiments, we collect data and we update our theories. The best science that we currently have suggests that for about the first one billion years of the Earth's history, the whole surface of the Earth was covered in volcanoes. Now, as you know, volcanoes are spewing out rock that is so hot it's turned into a liquid, what we call lava. Now, if you think about how hot that must have been, it makes complete sense that for the first billion years, there weren't any oceans on Earth because any water that was present would just turn into a gas because it would boil. In addition to spewing out molten rock, those volcanoes would have been giving out a selection of gases. And we currently believe that the Earth's early atmosphere was most similar to the atmospheres that we see today on Mars and on Venus. Those volcanoes would have been giving out a huge amount of carbon dioxide and very little oxygen or maybe even none at all. The volcanoes would also have been producing some nitrogen, which gradually built up in the atmosphere and also probably small amounts of methane and ammonia. As Earth aged, that volcanic activity started to die down, and with it the temperature on Earth began to drop, and eventually it fell low enough that all the water vapour that had been in the Earth's atmosphere was able to condense into liquid water, and suddenly we had the Earth's first oceans. Now this is important for two reasons. The first reason is that the carbon dioxide that was in the atmosphere was able to dissolve in those oceans, forming chemical compounds called carbonates, and some of these precipitated out. This means they became insoluble solids, which were able to drop to the bottom of the ocean. The second really important thing is that aquatic green organisms called algae began photosynthesizing. 
This early photosynthesis was happening over a billion years before the first true plants evolved, but it happens in exactly the same way as when plants do photosynthesis. So you need to know both the word equation and the balance symbol equation. And it's really important that if you're asked to write one of these in an exam, you do read the question because you won't get marks for a symbol equation if you're asked for a word equation and vice versa. The important thing about photosynthesis is that at the same time as making glucose for the plant, it also makes oxygen as a byproduct. So as these algae began to start photosynthesizing, the oxygen levels began to rise and rise and rise. And eventually they rose high enough that animals were able to evolve. Tiny sea creatures called plankton were able to use the carbon dioxide that dissolved in the oceans to make calcium carbonate shells. And when they died, the carbon was locked up in these calcium carbonate shells, which were compressed and eventually became sedimentary rocks like limestone and chalk. Other organic compounds found elsewhere in their bodies were turned into fossil fuels like crude oil. All of these things contributed to the lowering of the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. Before we start looking at the really up-to-date atmosphere today, let's just emphasise one more time. You may be asked to compare the early atmosphere to the modern atmosphere. And if that happens, you want to be talking about that early volcanic activity, the development of the oceans, the dissolving of carbon dioxide, the forming of sediments and the start of photosynthesis. That's completely separate to talking about industrialization, which is what we're going to look at now. Now let's look at greenhouse gases. What are they? Where do they come from? And why is everybody so concerned about them? Well, the first thing we should probably clear up is that greenhouse gases aren't fundamentally a bad thing. If there were no greenhouse gases on Earth, then it would be far too cold for life to survive. So we do need a little bit of them because they maintain temperatures that are high enough for life to survive. The best way to think about this is imagining that the greenhouse gases are a duvet because they do form a kind of blanket around the earth. If it's very cold, then you're quite grateful for your duvet because it keeps you nice and cosy and warm. But if somebody gave you a second duvet, well, you might start to think that that was a little bit overkill. And if they gave you a third duvet, then you'd probably be majorly overheating. The issue isn't that the duvet is a bad thing, it's just that you've got too much of it for what you need. And the same thing is true of greenhouse gases. We need a little bit of greenhouse gases, but right now we have too much. For AQA, GCSE, Chemistry or Combined Science, there are three greenhouse gases that you need to know the name of. Carbon dioxide, methane and water vapour. And here it's really crucial that you include the word vapour, because if you just say water, you're not going to get any marks on the exam. The next thing that you need to be able to explain is how these greenhouse gases actually cause the temperature of the Earth to change. The greenhouse gases form a kind of blanket around the Earth. Now, when electromagnetic radiation from the sun arrives at that blanket, waves that have a short wavelength, like visible light, ultraviolet, X-rays and gamma rays, are easily able to penetrate and get down to Earth's surface. There, they're absorbed, and then when they're re-emitted by the Earth, they have slightly less energy and they have a slightly longer wavelength. And those longer wavelength waves aren't so easily able to penetrate the blanket. So they can't get back out and instead they're just reflected back down to Earth. And then they start to warm up the Earth's atmosphere. So overall, the temperature starts to rise. Now you may be asked about the consequences of that temperature rise. And quite often the question will include the words global warming. So you don't get any marks for saying that greenhouse gases cause the temperature to rise because it's kind of implied by the name global warming. But you need to be thinking about the consequences that happen a little bit further down the stream. So the first one that's fairly obvious is the melting ice caps, and this can lead to flooding. Now the really important thing when you talk about ice caps melting is that you need to be saying ice caps, not just ice, not icebergs. Ice caps are those massive ice sheets that cover the Arctic and the Antarctic. They're thousands and thousands of kilometres squared, so we're not just talking about a small piece of ice in the ocean. The second thing that happens is extreme weather events. There are more storms and also more hurricanes. The third thing is that because of those fluctuations in weather, there can be crop failures and this can lead to famine. And then finally, we can think about habitat destruction and extinction. But if you're going to talk about these, it's important that you're talking about examples that will actually be affected by global warming. So talking about polar habitats being destroyed 
or Arctic animals like polar bears going extinct. We don't just want to say habitat destruction without qualifying it because that on its own is not enough for a mark. You've probably heard lots of people being concerned about the impact of human activities on the level of these greenhouse gases, and rightly so. In the last 250 years alone, human activities have led the level of carbon dioxide to increase by about 50%. A big chunk of that is because of industrialization and the fact that we've been burning so many fossil fuels. So that's coal and oil and all the fuels that are derived from oil like petrol and diesel and naphtha and also natural gas or methane. This could be in cars and lorries and aeroplanes or in factories. A large proportion of the electricity that we use in the UK is generated from fossil fuel power stations. To make matters worse, where in the past a lot of these carbon dioxide emissions were offset by rainforests and other wooded areas, we've been undertaking deforestation on a massive scale, felling acres and acres of the Amazon. And where in the past those trees would have been absorbing that carbon dioxide to use as a reactant for photosynthesis, if they're not there anymore, they just can't take it in. So deforestation is also having a massive impact on carbon dioxide levels. Finally, we've also been digging up a lot of a resource called peat. You can kind of think of peat as a bit like fancy compost, and people dig it up both to use as a fuel and also because it makes a really good compost for your garden. It's not just carbon dioxide we need to worry about though. Methane is also a really serious greenhouse gas, even if it gets less headlines and less time in the news. There are three big human activities that are all majorly contributing to methane levels. The first one is cattle farming, and this one you've probably heard of because, well, it's kind of funny to think of. So one of the biggest sources of methane emissions is the fact that where you have cattle, and particularly where they've been fed on grain rather than grass, they basically fart out a load of methane. The second thing that's really contributing to methane levels is rice farming. So in order to farm rice, you need to flood the rice paddy, so their roots are literally underwater. And in those waterlogged conditions, the roots have bacteria living in them, which are giving off lots and lots of methane. Finally, landfill, where things are rotting and breaking down, is another huge source of methane. This is another part of the specification where it's really likely that you get questions about the scientific method. So why do scientists publish their data? Why do people believe them? And so you need to have this idea that there's a huge amount of data and lots of different scientific groups around the world have done the same experiments and have been able to verify each other's data and show that there isn't any bias there and that this is objective fact, that the levels of these gases is increasing and that it probably is our fault and that it probably is going to contribute to global climate change. Now, there are still a few sceptics out there, even within the scientific community, and part of the issue is that people really want us to be able to pin down an exact prediction for exactly what's going to happen next and when and why and how. But we're talking about a really complicated system here with hundreds of different variables, and so it's really hard to produce an exact model. And instead, what we tend to do is simplify our models, but also people maybe speculate about what they think might happen, and there can also be some biased opinions. And sometimes the media really feeds into this, because although sometimes they can report really fairly both sides, sometimes they'll give two sides of the story and make it sound like they're equally valid, when on one side we have 99 scientists with lots of data, and on the other side we have one person with something that's just their opinion. So it's really important that wherever possible, we look at the actual scientific data. You should know that a carbon footprint is the total amount of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that are emitted over the full life cycle of a product, service or event. And this can be reduced both by directly reducing the emissions, so burning fewer fossil fuels so that less carbon dioxide is given out, but also by reducing the amount of energy used or transport used. So things like if you're buying food more locally, so it doesn't have to be driven over long distances to get to you, well, that's going to have a knock-on impact on the amount of carbon dioxide being released. Or for instance, if you're using less electricity, then that will result in fewer fossil fuels being burnt to generate that electricity. This ties in really nicely with the Unit 10 topic of life cycle assessment. Burning fossil fuels isn't just problematic from the point of view of the carbon dioxide being released. There are a number of other problems associated with other pollutants, and it's important that you know the names of these. 
at no point in GCSE chemistry are you going to be given credit for just saying that it causes pollution or it's bad for the environment. You need to be able to be specific. So as well as carbon dioxide, which is created from the complete combustion of hydrocarbon fuels and which causes global warming, if there's less oxygen, then you might make carbon monoxide or carbon particulates. Carbon monoxide is an odourless, colourless, toxic gas which poisons people by stopping their red blood cells from being able to carry oxygen. While carbon particulates, or soot, cause a problem called global dimming, where less sunlight is able to penetrate the Earth's atmosphere because of these tiny particles of soot. And so there's literally less light reaching the Earth's surface. Also, lots of fossil fuels contain sulphur impurities. So when they're burnt, the sulphur is burnt as well. And this creates sulphur dioxide, which causes both respiratory problems and if it dissolves in clouds, it can cause acid rain. Finally, in a combustion engine, the temperature rises so high that nitrogen from the atmosphere, despite being really unreactive, is able to react with oxygen and cause various different oxides of nitrogen to form. And these too can cause acid rain and respiratory problems. Finally, you need to be able to write balanced symbol equation for these combustion reactions where carbon dioxide is formed. Combustion is the burning of a fuel in oxygen. So here I've got a hydrocarbon fuel and when it combusts or burns, it's going to produce two products, carbon dioxide and water. Now the law of conservation of mass tells me that whatever atoms I have on the left of my equation in the reactants, I must have on the right in the products. That's why the equation has to balance. If I look at my fuel, I can see that I have 11 carbon atoms, and that means there must be 11 carbon atoms in the products. So since carbon dioxide is the only molecule that contains carbon, I know that I must have 11 of that molecule. Likewise, there are 24 hydrogen atoms on the left, so there must be 24 hydrogen atoms on the right in my products. Here, I've got water molecules, which each contain a pair of hydrogen atoms. So although I have 24 hydrogen atoms, that means I'm going to need 12 water molecules because each one has two hydrogen atoms in it. Now to work out the amount of oxygen in the reactants on the left hand side of my equation, I need to count it up on the right. So I have 11 carbon dioxide molecules, each containing two atoms, that's 22 in total. Then I have my 12 water molecules and each one only contains one oxygen atom. So that's another 12. 22 plus 12 is 34 oxygen atoms. So I must have 34 oxygen atoms on the left, but each oxygen atom is part of a molecule containing two atoms, a divalent molecule or a diatomic molecule. So therefore, I'm only going to need 17 oxygen molecules. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope that you found that a useful summary of everything in Unit 9 of AQA GCSE Chemistry. If you did find it useful, then don't forget to like and subscribe for more GCSE Chemistry videos coming soon.